The title of this message is called Called Out. Look to your neighbor and say, Called Out. It's not what you think. Don't worry. Don't freak out. All right, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your word, for your wisdom to us by your spirit, God. Lord, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, there's probably been some times in your life where there was something that you knew that you should have done, you didn't do it, and then you wish you would have done it. You following me so far? Come on, come on. Are, are we awake for a service? Things that like, ah, I, I know I should have done that, but then I didn't do it. Um, I've mentioned this before from the platform. I think Pastor Matt messaged it, you know, one of his um, illustrations, but about four months ago, by the grace of God, I was not planning it. It honestly just literally just kind of happened where I did a half marathon and I thought, wow, like this is great. It's probably never going to happen again. Let's just like, let's ride the momentum, you know, like maybe, the, maybe there's a full marathon, right? Like in my, uh, you know, amazing runner, runner career that shouldn't be happening right now. Right. And so, so two weeks after the half marathon happened, I never cramp up ever. I just don't. And so maybe like five minutes in, I get a little small cramp right here. I'm like, I don't need to stop. I, I, just, I did a half marathon, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep going. And so literally after a minute of just me cramping up, I'm like, ah, this is kind of too much. I'm going to just call, call it, call it quits. Right. Um, that, that cramp stayed there for about maybe five more minutes, went away, called, called running. The next day, the cramp came back and I wasn't even running. And like, it was there for an hour. And I was like, this, does this, is this normal? Is this like the life of a marathon runner? Like, is this worth it? And um, long story short, the pain went away, but then it just, like, it literally felt like a bruised rib. And so I went to the doctor, and I'm like, I, I, I didn't fall. I didn't, like, there's, there was no blunt or traumatic floors. He looked, he checked, he's like, you've got a bruised rib. I'm like, how is that possible? <laughs> I get, and I didn't, I didn't know this until I went to the doctor. Uh, you could actually have enough force push it up against your rib, even from a little bitty wussy cramp that I was having, and it actually bruised my rib. Just for, from, just for two minutes of just cramping up. Um, that's my sad story. Don't worry, we're going to get to the gospel in, in a moment. So I want you just some sympathy. I don't feel any sympathy right now, but it's fine. Um, yeah, it's whatever. It's too late now. I love you too. <laughs> I love you, Danny. And uh, if you did want to feel bad for me, this is, this is the moment. I couldn't run for five weeks after that. Like, no walking. I mean, I did a little some walking, but literally couldn't even jog. I'm like, my marathon runner dreams are dead. It's gone, right? And I got to tell you, I, if I could go back to those two minutes, why did you keep running? Why did you keep doing that, right? I think we've all been in situations and in moments where there's things that we knew we shouldn't do, but we did it anyways, like that time when I went to 7-Eleven and I got a hot dog. That's more of a youth group sermon, you know, illustration. I'll let you figure out, you know. But I think, I think a lot of us, if we're not careful, we're just, we're over-informed. Meaning, like, there's more stuff that we know, but we're actually not applying it. There's things that we know about ourselves, about maybe business and relationships and marriage and even Jesus and again, information isn't bad. I mean, man, honestly, praise God for the generation that we're living in right now where, man, you could literally learn like from anyone and about anything. I mean, even, you know, I just, <laughs> embarrassing, but probably about maybe only a month ago, I truly discovered ChatGPT and just asking random questions. I got to tell you, if you have a workout coach, you could fire them. Like, just ask ChatGPT what to do and how to switch this around. You'll be good. You'll be solid. If you are a coach in here, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to ruin your, your business. But it's just, there's information at your fingertips. But what's crazy about all of that is that information doesn't lead to transformation. Information doesn't lead, it, it, it's not an automatic uh, pass um, for us to actually grow. You know, last week, Pastor Matt mentioned how we are all truly overconnected and that we need to disconnect from some of these things so we can connect with God, I think in a similar way, we're over-informed. 
And there's many, many reasons for that, but I think, I know for myself, maybe you too, that we become so satisfied with knowing that we're okay with not applying. It's almost like if I know it, come on, you know those situations, right? When you're, maybe you need some wisdom and counsel, you're talking to someone that you respect and love and admire, and they try to give you some wisdom, I know that. If you did, why aren't you doing it? Right? And I, so I think a lot of times what can happen is more knowledge doesn't guarantee more growth. And, and, and again, information is not the enemy, but I think sometimes we, get, we consume so many things, and it could be information, it could be relationships, just consuming, consuming, but it's almost like we don't know what to do with it. I, I love the illustration of a, of a sponge where it can, it can only absorb so much water until you actually got to wring it out. Could you imagine if, myself included, what if we actually applied 25% of what we already know, but we're not doing currently? Just think about that. Like, when, when it comes to our marriages, when it comes to maybe pursuing our spouses and investing in what if we just took the little that we knew? Again, wouldn't be perfect, but I bet there'd be some progress, right? I think e even in our relationship with God, maybe when it comes to how we spend our time, right, if we actually just did what we knew what to do. Pastor Chris, you're making it sound pretty easy. It's not. It's complicated. We're going to keep talking about it. But 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says this. Paul says this. Dear brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I couldn't talk to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk as though you belonged to the world, as though you were infants in Christ. I had to feed you with milk and not with solid food because you weren't ready for anything stronger. You know, one of the things I love about Scripture is that you can hear the tone of the author. Is it encouraging? Are they correcting? Are they speaking with joy? When, when you read Paul's tone to the uh, church in Corinth, he's exhorting them. He's like, hey, wake up. And it's almost like the way that he's talking to them, it's almost, hey, this is going to hurt a little bit, but it's not meant to hurt you. It's meant to help you. Like, I want to talk. He's basically say, he's saying is, I want to talk to you like you're mature, but you're not there yet. Does that hurt anybody yet? It's like, it's like wait, what? And, and there, there could be so many reasons for this, right? But, but he says this in verse three, and you still aren't ready for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. You're jealous of one another and quarrel with each other. Doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? And aren't you living like people of the world? When one of you says, I am a follower of Paul, and another one says, I'm a follower of Apollos, aren't you acting like just like people of the world? You know what's so crazy? Paul didn't tell the people in Corinth, hey, you're not mature because you don't know enough things. He didn't say, hey, you're not mature because, man, you haven't listened to your podcasts. He didn't say that. He's like, you're, man, you're not mature because you're still controlled by your sinful nature. You know what's so interesting? Again, this is like a very quick summary of this. But you can even just take this text and say, hey, when we look at spiritual maturity, Paul defines it really quickly in just two easy ways. One is that we're controlled by the spirit and not by our flesh. Like, like we're actually allowing the spirit of God to lead us to mature us, that I don't just know the right things, but I'm actually going to put them into practice. But also, look what he says after that. The fruit of being controlled by your sinful nature is that you're jealous of one another and you quarrel with each other. And also, instead of bringing unity to the body of Christ, you're actually bringing division. Why follow Paul? Why follow Apollos? Paul's like, you're acting just like the people of the world. So you could even make a, just a really basic argument when it comes to spiritual maturity. I'm controlled by the spirit and I'm not controlled by the flesh, but also I respond to people the way God responds to me. I think a lot of times when we think about disciplines, right? We got to discipline ourselves to read scripture. We got to discipline ourselves to pray. We got to discipline ourselves to fast. Yes and amen to that. We're doing that Monday through Wednesday. Pray first. You know, we don't fast and pray to get God's attention. We do that so we can get our attention on to God. Let's do that. But also, we often don't think that community in our relationships 
That needs to be a discipline. It's almost like it, it's an option. It's a choice where it's like, no, I, I'm going to discipline myself with me and God, but me and people, eh, that's an option. But Paul, Paul, Paul makes it very clear. The reason how I know that you're controlled by your sinful nature, one of the things, it's how you're treating one another. You're jealous. You're quarreling. And listen, and, and, and Paul, they're even talking about Paul himself. I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of Paul. I'm a follower of this. I'm a follower of that. Aren't you acting like the people of this world? And so spiritual maturity in Paul's eyes in the New Testament through the eyes of Scripture is I'm controlled by the Spirit and not my flesh, but also a fruit of that, a fruit that I'm knowing that I'm being controlled by the Spirit is how I'm loving people, how I'm serving people. I think that when you look at the, the New Testament, we've said this a lot, but I think, it, it, again, information is one thing, but it's another thing to walk it out, is that three quarters of the New Testament that we have, it is what's called one another statements. Meaning that when Paul says in Colossians, forgive one another, why? Because Christ has forgiven you. Be compassionate to one another. Why? Because Christ has been compassionate to you. So it's literally, it's impossible to read the scriptures and to make an argument, to have all this knowledge. But hey, it's just me and God, me and God, me and God. Where it's like, God's like, no, 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 no. It's you. <laughs> Guess what? It's everybody else. It's the church. And I got to tell you, you know, if I were to ask you, which I'm not, this is rhetorical. But if I were to ask you, what are the five last messages that have just changed your life that you'll never forget? The reason why I, did, I wanted to, to be rhetorical because as a preacher, that can hurt. It's like, wait, you don't remember? Wait, what? You don't remember the message, right? I have to remind myself of something like what I preach. But if I were to ask you, who are five people that have touched, changed, and made an impact your life? Two, two, two. Do, do. Why? Because content is one thing, but connection far outweighs that as far as the impact. And so when it comes to community and the people in our lives, it, 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 makes, it makes a big deal. And so when the, the discipline of community, it's got to be something that goes out of our uh, heads and it goes into our hearts. Some of the things I think that actually keep us from community is studies have shown as of 2024 that one out of three adults have said that they feel lonely weekly. Just think about that. Size of this room, probably got over 150 people. My guesstimation would be 189. How does he do that? I don't know. I'm just throwing out numbers. One out of three people say they, they feel lonely and they express that at least weekly. Did you know that the, um, um, the lead uh, surgeon in um, America has even said that loneliness is such an epidemic that the numbers that we're seeing right now, it's going to double and what we're experiencing right now. And that's not even coming from a church. It's coming from the world. Like, man, this is a problem. Like, this, this is not good. So I think loneliness keeps us from community. I think, honestly, if we're just keeping it real, like, priorities, right? Time. Like, it's, like, it's almost like, man, I love people, but where do I fit people in my life? Do I fit them on Tuesdays between 7 and 8, or do I fit them on Sunday on this time? Because after that, I got no, I, I don't got a place, Right? I think sometimes it can just be like our personalities, or at least that we think that it is, right? Extroverts need people, and introverts don't need people. It's like, no, we are created in the image of God. But I think, honestly, I think what a lot of it comes down to is that um, we approach relationships with a consumer mindset. Like, like, what I can get out of it, and if it doesn't fit me, then it's just, it's just hard to invest. You know, we had a, we've been having a very big dilemma in our household. We have three kids and our TV isn't working. Do you see the dilemma? <laughs> um, big problems at our home, you know, and to like have three kids and then, and then like an, 
have them share an iPad? Oh, have mercy, Jesus. It's not even worth it. I got to tell you, we're getting our steps in more. We're going on family walks. We're doing everything because just to, to share that iPad, good luck, right? And I got to tell you, I really want to say the name of the TV company, but I won't. But if you ask me later, I might be my flesh. I might tell you, right? But we, I've just been on the phone. When are you going to get here? Oh, we're going to come this day. No, no. How about next week? It's like, oh, are you serious? So I, I moved from them. And then I went to a different company. And I, by the grace of God, we have a scheduled appointment this Thursday. And I'm telling, I am, I'm pumped, not even because to watch TV, but just to have a unified home. And I got to tell you, I'm, I'm being so serious. And so I got to tell you, what, what made me change from company to company to company wasn't because I liked the company more than the other. It wasn't because, oh, I just, I want to bless them. No, I'm not getting what I should be getting out of this, Right. I paid this amount of money for this part, right? Their timetable is terrible, right? I've got nothing invested unless it, it impacts me. And I feel like if we're not careful, we could have that same approach when it comes to relationships. And not just relationships, but Christ-centered ones. And I got to tell you, you know, when it comes to being a consumer in relationships, let me say a couple things. One is that we all have needs, we all want to be loved. We all want to be seen. We all want to have purpose. We all want to be served and serve others, right? So what I'm not attacking is this innate need that we actually need one another. Hey, you, you feed me. I feed you. Yeah, absolutely. But what I'm getting at is, is a lot of times when it comes to a consumeristic mindset, we don't put ourselves in that mindset that that could be me or you because, no, I mean, of course I know that it's not about me. Of course I know that this can't all be about my preferences and comfort, but we still act that way. And I know that because I know that when I get into a friendship or maybe I come into a small group or maybe um, I, I come into close proximity and when things aren't going well, things maybe went a little sideways. Or Honestly, maybe it just gets out of my comfort zone. Ooh, you're, you're a little too much for me. My first thought is, hey, let me run towards you. I want to serve you. Let's figure out what's going on. It's almost like, is there another small group? Is there another church? Is there another church I can work at? Is there, I mean, and again, so I don't think any of us, was, most of us wouldn't say, I know, I know it's not about me, but if we look at our investment of how we put ourselves in other people's lives, that's a good gauge. I think what can happen is a, a, a indicator if we're not careful of how consumeristic all of us can be when it comes to relationships, especially in the context of Christ in a relationship is, is that do we prioritize more of an ideal community or one that's actually real? Now, what I mean by, uh, by ideal is that, man, I have a community that fits this box for me and this box for me, but if we're not careful... Um, we actually, we're not actually living in community. We're just choosing our preferences. I love what uh, John Mark Comer says in Practicing the Way. As Bonhoeffer said, those who love their dream of a Christian community more than they love Christian community itself become destroyers of that Christian community. Even though their personal intentions may ever be so honest, earnest, and sacrificial. He called this the wish dream of an ideal church. No actual church are, is able to live up to the wish dream of an ideal church. So people either give up on church entirely or they settle in their cynicism. I got to tell you, like, if we're not careful, um, we can actually treat community the way that the world does inst instead of the church. Like, if we're not careful, if we, like, just go to our own preferences and comforts, and what I'm not saying is we should have values, we should have standards, there should be some things that we expect, but I think, honestly, most of us, if we're being honest, we more so run away from the things that are uncomfortable than run towards it. It's almost like we intellectually know Jesus said, I've come for not the healthy, I've come for the sick, but it's almost like we've kind of disconnected ourselves from that. That's for him, but that's not for me. No, no, no. It's for him, but it's for all of us as well. It's for all of us in that picture. And so I think like at best, at best, you know, we're being consumeristic. But if we're not careful at the world, we just start canceling. 
because it's, it doesn't fit our boat. You know, it, it continues. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and the spirit of God lives in you? You know, that um, the word for temple and the word for church in the New Testament, one of the most prominent ones is the word ecclesia. So if you want to impress anybody in your life, hey, you know what church means? Ecclesia. And really what it means, it's, it, mean, it means called out. It, 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 like as as the, the body of Christ, we've been called out of darkness so that we can be light bearers to the world. Now, get this picture. Like, we know that Christ, he died for me, he died for you. But when it comes to us actually coming to Christ... It's almost like, our, yes, our salvation comes to, from him only, but when we look around, there's a whole community too. And that's why we're called the body of Christ, because it's not just me and God, but it's also me and my brothers and my sisters. And so we've been called out of darkness into light so that we can shine. So if you're taking notes, you can jot this down, is that we're called not to consume the church, we're called to be the church. We're called not just to take it in, but what, God, what do you want to do through me and when it comes to community? So that's what I want to talk to us this morning about is how can we actually make community into a discipline in our lives? Uh, Acts 2.42 says this, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. Um, if you want me, if you want to get me back somewhere, just have food and, and have good food. And I love this verse for so many reasons. This is like, it, it encompasses the New Testament church so much. It, it's been encompassing our vision at our church for over a year now that we want to create Acts 242 environments. But I, ask, I, I love the word fellowship. Because fellowship, I think a lot of times, like, I don't know about you, but my church, it actually had a fellowship hall. Are you familiar with the fellowship hall? Where literally it's a hall, and mine actually said fellowship on there. And you know what was under that fellowship? Food. A lot of food. There was times where it's like we didn't even need to go to Sizzler, all you can eat. We had the fellowship hall. Yeah, I'm not joking. It's like, man, we would go out. We'd be in the Lord's presence. We'd worship. We'd pray. And then we'd fellowship. And I got to tell you, fellowship is great. It's amazing. You know, when there's food involved, it's incredible. But the original word for fellowship is koinonia. Koinonia, there, I mean, I think if you've been in church for a little while, the temptation is to hear common words and phrases and it can, it, can, it can lose its, its awe. It can lose its impact. So when we think of koinonia, don't just think fellowship, absolutely. But koinonia, some great words, is partnership. It means um, contributing to one another. It, it, mean, it means to share. And there's, there, it, it, it is all over Scripture, but mainly when we see the word koinonia, is that we have koinonia with God. God desires for us to have koinonia, a partnership, a participation, a sharing. And God wants us to share his life. Um, he wants to share his life with us, and we want to share our life back with him. Also, there is koinonia around the gospel. When Paul talks about the gospel, it's like, thank you for sharing in the gospel with me. Do you know what I love about the family of God? There's so many things, but one of them is that I may not know you deeply yet. I may not know that your story yet, but I love you because there is fellowship around the gospel. The gospel that saved you, the gospel that saved me, is that it is level playing field at the cross. So Paul says, hey, there is a koinonia with us because we share in the gospel together. But also, Paul talks about a koinonia around just gifts and giving, where it's like, man, thank you for supporting my ministry. Thank you for your koinonia and, and moving the mission forward. But, but this passage, I want to talk about the koinonia amongst believers, okay? Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 says this, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ, any comfort from his love, any koinonia, 
together in the spirit. Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, and working together with one purpose. I love this because when Paul's talking about spiritual unity, he's starting with their relationships. He continues, I don't have time, in verse 3, saying, hey, don't be conceited. Don't be selfish. Like, think about others more than yourself. And then Paul talks about the example of Christ. And don't forget about Christ. He actually humbled himself under the cross. So I love that Paul doesn't just go to, don't be, just don't be selfish. Don't be conceited. Think about others, right? No, no. He's like, Remember the unity that we have in the Spirit of God. This is a whole other message, but a lot of times we just try to agree with one another about our opinions and, and all these things, but we forget about the spiritual unity that we already have in Christ. You know, when I was, um, when I was 22 years old, 21, I was a director um, at a church of middle school students, and I remember we had a great team, and um, we had one leader, seasoned, older, just an amazing woman of God, uh, Dawn Marie, and she was on our youth team. And it was great because, like, we had a great relationship where, you know, I led her. She was a key volunteer. Honestly, she was way smarter than me, <laughs> way more mature than me. And I'm like, wow, she's allowing me to lead her. This is, I'm not worthy, God, <laughs> right? And, and, and I had one of these moments, you know, where, and again, I'm still growing, but back then, I really needed to grow. <laughs> like, there's a lot of points I just was just lacking maturity in. And one of the things I didn't realize, you know, till later on is that I would use sarcasm as a way to mask my feelings and my emotions. And sarcasm just wasn't healthy. It sometimes would put people down. And I remember I was leading a team meeting. Honestly, I, I forgot what I said. I, I didn't think it was that bad. She's like, Chris, come here. I'm like, okay. And honestly, when someone of that, like, that's respectable and honorable, it's almost like a mother in the faith, you, you, you go, you run when they talk that way. Hey, I want to talk to you in your office. She pulled me in my office. I'm like, all right, talk to me, mom. <laughs> like, what's going on? She's like, what is up with your attitude today? And I was like, man, uh, that's exactly what happened. I didn't know what to say. I was like, I, and she's like, you're, you're far more called than how you're acting. Your, your behavior doesn't fit your identity. Like, you gotta stop using sarcasm to hide who you really are. I was like, oh gosh. It was, it was, it was like an hour before service. You know, I'm all like getting teary-eyed before I preach. I'm like, oh gosh, you preached on me. <laughs> I gotta tell you, that was a, like literally a game changer. God used that amazing woman of God to shape me. But I got to tell you, that was a, a confronting moment. That was a, a moment from Jesus. But it was also, you know what it was? It was koinonia. It was, it was the body of Christ sharpening one another. I think sometimes, if we're not careful, we allow koinonia in fellowship to be, to be defined by programs, and things that we're doing, which is not bad, but it's not defined, but it's not less than, but it's also so much more than that. That's why we talk about small groups. It, it's not a destination, it's a vehicle. I've, I've met so many people that have jumped into a small group and they didn't just get community, but they got so much more than that. So we have to understand that fellowship, it's not less than friendship, but it's so much more than that. It, it's actually, it forms you spiritually. I, I would say it this way, is that God uses the relationships to form and to forge our maturity. God uses the relationships to form and to forge our, relation, our, our maturity in, in, in God. Yeah, I think sometimes that when we want to have community, sometimes we can get in the trap of just finding our person or the one person. What do I mean by that? I, I just I need one mentor. I need one coach. I need one person. Man, praise God for that. Like, we need to have people that, that we look towards, but we need more than just one person. We need a community of God that can surround us. What we need is that we need a, a community that we can live out the gospel with. You know, um, this was maybe a couple years ago. I was at a coaching retreat, and uh, one of the coaches, they had a panel. You know, they were sharing best practices. And uh, he said this phrase, I don't have any secrets. 
You know when someone says something really bold and just gets your attention like, are you, are you lying right now? It's like when someone says like, I've never lied before. It's like, yeah, that's a lie. That's, you're not telling the truth. So when he said, I don't have any secrets, I'm like, tell me more. Like, like what do you mean by that? And what he began to talk about is that he's like, I, I've got three people in my life. I've got my pastor. I've got my, I got my spouse. And I have my, my therapist. Among those three people and everyone else God has placed in my life, I know who to go to, when to go to, because I'm surrounded. I think a lot of times, you know, some of the reasons why we get stuck in finding community is that we're, we can become very narrow-minded and really make it about what, still like what I can get out of this. We need to have multiple people for multiple purposes in our lives. Again, not to use them, but we need to be refined by community. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I love this, either way, Christ's love controls us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died to our old life. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. Verse 16, so now we've stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one point, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view, but how differently we know him. Worship team, you guys can come behind me right now. You know, I love what Paul is saying is Christ's love, it compels me, it controls me, that, you know, I, I, I was once dead and now I'm alive. And one of the things that has changed is how I see people. You know, when the world sees brokenness, they run away or they judge it. But Christ, he embraces it and he loves and he challenges. And I think we need to have that same approach that we want to have community that's based, again, not on the world, but on the gospel. Proverbs 27, 17 says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Everybody wants a friend to sharpen them until they get a friend that sharpens them. <laughs> Everybody wants to be coached until like, they actually need to be coached, right? And they got to own some things. They got to take responsibility. And I think when it comes to... Christ in relationships. I think we often reject what God's trying to redeem in our lives. The things, the things that we're often scared of, God actually is using to free us of, and it comes through relationships. I think if you're taking notes, um, I'm going to land the plane here. You guys can jot this down. You know, we need to have Pauls in our life. We need to have Silas's in our life. And we need to have Timothy's in our life. I don't have time to fully go through that, but when you think of someone like a Paul, that's someone who's a little further ahead, that can speak life, that can speak encouragement to you, that could be in a small group, that could be in a multiple ways. Actually, I, I heard someone recently tell me that, you know, my kids are growing up, so I'm going to this godly dad because they're ahead of me, and I just want to learn from wisdom and not from consequence. I love that. I love that persistence there. And so if I could speak to the, the younger generation, is that there is a blessing that when we come under um, elders, there is a blessing when we come under those that have gone further and faster than us, and we got to be teachable. Like, there, there, there is such a blessing when we honor those that have gone before us and not just in title, but because God, like I, I want you to do that same thing in me. And so I've, me personally, I've never gone wrong with saying, God, I'm gonna submit myself to somebody else because there's a blessing to that. And I, and I would say for those that are part of more, more of the older generation, you have so much to give, so much to offer. You know, it's interesting because um, I, you know, with serving in our youth ministry, I got to say, um, we, had, we had our one night last Wednesday. Um, so many students came. We had three salvations, so many, so many rededications. And God is just moving within our youth ministry. And uh, we had the best team. 
they love our students. They, they're, they're, they're incredible. You know, it, it, it's, it's so interesting because <laughs> there, literally there are times where our students will use words. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means. And I'm like, where's ChatGPT at? Hook me up. Tell me, tell me what's going on. And I got to tell you that even though trends may change, there are some truths that will never change. And when it comes to those that need the Lord, which is all of us, everyone needs love. Everyone needs acceptance. Everyone needs purpose, right? And so we get to be on those front lines. No matter what generation it is, we get to invest. So I, what, what I'm calling us today to do church is that we would look at the rhythms of our lives. We would look at the, the disciplines in our lives and really just ask this one question, is how am I living out the gospel in the relationships around me? And I think a lot of times, like we can just think so narrow about it and just fix, but it's in all of our relationships. I think one, one way to, uh, to gauge that is our proximity. You can't be formed by a relationship if you're actually not close enough to it. And so if it's joining a small group, if it's getting closer to those that are in your immediate circle, I know God wants to use that and he wants to bless that. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your mercy. God, I thank you for your grace. God, I thank you, Lord, that you are changing hearts this morning. And I pray, Lord, in Jesus' name, God, that you would help us, God, to not just find community, God, but to be community, Lord. God, you've called us not to be consumers of the church, God, but Lord, you've called us, God, to, to be the church. So Lord, help us to do that, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Come on, can we give God some praise right now, church? Let's go, let's go. You guys can stay on your feet right now.